So uh, I want to thank, uh, well, Gideon for coming out tonight, and uh, Blue Rider Press, which has taken a huge risk by being so supportive of an author that it's made me question my self-loathing, which is, you know, sort of hitting you. It remains to be seen if it will survive sufficiently. Your um, self-loathing? Yes, to continue to be able to write. You know how that works. <clears throat> um, thank you for being here. So Gary just flew in from Portland. And boy, are my arms tired. <laughs> um, after having been on tour for the last two weeks. So Gary's done a lot of these things. Um, uh, so I guess... I, we're going to talk for 20 or 25 minutes. Maybe Gary will read at some point for a few minutes, and then we will open up questions, uh, open up to questions from you guys. Um, so Gary's book, if you guys, I mean, I assume you have some familiarity with Gary's book, but Gary's book is about the making of the fifth revision of the DSM, which comes out on Wednesday, right? Um, and so I, I, I guess my first question is, this your book came out two weeks ago, and it has received pretty much uniformly positive reviews, and everyone has been piling on to the DSM. So the question is, who might defend the DSM? Why is nobody defending the DSM? And what does it mean that you can't find anybody who will defend the DSM? Yeah, the poor DSM. <laughs> I've been feeling sorry for them for actually for two years. Um, so there's, there's uh, two ways to, there's two answers to that question. Um, why won't anybody defend the DSM? First of all, it's because the people who produce the DSM frankly don't have the chops to defend it. You need to have a fairly sophisticated grasp of uh, postmodern philosophies to defend a, a book full of signifiers that don't have a signified. Uh, and the semioticians seem to have gone into a different Wait, let, actually, profession. let's stop there for one minute. Oh. Why don't you explain that to everyone? Oh, really? Uh, since you've been talking about, you've been writing about this for years, but you've been talking I, about this for two, two weeks. weeks so. I've never said that. <laughs> uh, so so what, what does it mean that, this, that the DSM is full of uh, signifiers without a signifier? So, so what that means is that the, 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 the mental disorders that are listed in the DSM, which are the mental disorders that drugs are aimed at, that research is uh, supposed to be tied to, the mental disorders that you have if you go see a therapist, the mental disorders that your psychiatrist is supposedly treating when they give you drugs and so on, those mental disorders by everybody's uh, uh, understanding don't exist. They are myths. Uh, well, they call them constructs, but a construct is a myth. It's a, 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 an idea that guides uh, the way we uh, understand the world. So uh, one of the reasons that everybody's piling on to the DSM right now is because uh, opening it up to revision has opened up to the public the knowledge that psychiatrists have had for 30 years, which is that the book is a book of constructs. It's not a book of real entities. And uh, that, depending on who you are, that news is either uh, deeply embarrassing because you have staked your entire profession on a, being able to say that you know what mental disorders are, or it's an enormous opportunity. For somebody like me, it's an opportunity to write a book. Um, for somebody like the head of the National Institute of Mental Health, who has never liked the DSM and would like to see it disappear if it could, uh, it was an opportunity to uh, say, okay, we know this is true. We know these things don't exist. We would like all of you researchers to come over to us. We're divorcing the DSM. We're leaving it for a younger, sexier uh, 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 lover. Um, <laughs> Called, what are the attributes called, of this younger, sexier well, lover? Well, uh, we, the, the, the lover is called neuroscience, and it's this tremendously tempting idea that we can um, decode human behavior and experience and consciousness and understand it in terms of neurocircuitry. Uh, and the reason that that's a very tempting idea is because that would really unlock the keys to who we are. You would no longer have to worry that your understanding of human nature was controlled by politics or, you know, point of view or prejudice or desire or any of these things. It would just be as true as a colony of streptococcus bacteria under a microscope. That's the dream. It's uh, quite a dream. I, I'm not particularly fond of it. But um, if, if indeed that was the case, then whenever there was suffering, there would be a way to decode it, to boil it down to those the neurocircuits that cause it, and presumably 
uh, treat it. That's the beauty part, at least if you're a drug company. Um, so, all right. So then who, all right, so, but at the same time, the APA likes to say that, um, well, actually medicine isn't really medicine in the first place. Yeah, and that's a totally fair point. You know, this whole idea that a s disease is a form of suffering that has a biochemical cause, this is a, this is a myth. This is another myth. This is a big myth. And this is a historical accident, that myth. It has to do with the discovery of the germ, the, the germ theory of medicine, which came in about 150 years ago. And the idea that you could find the causes of, Ill, of suffering in you know, cells or molecules or whatever the unit was. And when doctors were suddenly, and it was sudden, able to uh, cure diseases that killed people routinely, you know, strep throat killed children. Uh, um, syphilis affected maybe 40% of the people in Europe at the turn of the 20th century. When they were able to do that, they were um, able to turn around, uh, they were able to enhance the power of medicine. And this myth is that we can target any, we can turn any kind of suffering into that kind of uh, illness. So when we uh, see that when, when we say that psychiatry can't do that, psychiatry can't find these targets, the fact is there's an awful lot of diseases, physical diseases, that we can't find the targets for either. And as time goes on, more and more of those illnesses become problematic. Autoimmune disease is a really good example. We don't really understand how that happens. So medicine functions on a bacteriological model. It functions on the germ theory. And in fact, we've run out of diseases that are caused by germs. So when the American Psychiatric Association says that, they're not wrong. And it's possible that psychiatry, for all its problems, is actually on the leading edge, not lagging behind. They're actually dealing with the kinds of difficulties that are going to be much more complicated, are going to have to take into account many more things besides uh, molecular activity inside the body, like what goes on in society and how income is distributed and how people experience their lives. So one of their strategies then has been to say that, well, we used to use Roman numerals for the ESM. Now we're switching to Arabic numerals, and this is so that we could be more like technology and have a 5.1, 5.2, and make, they've been saying that this is a living document. So what does this mean that the DSM would be a living document? And nope. what does it mean for the credibility of the APA? Nobody knows. <laughs> I mean, I, I wish I could answer that question. I've asked that question many times to many people, both, uh, and, and I haven't... I don't know. I mean, the idea is, you know, 5.0, 5.1, they're going to beta test it. But the problem with beta testing is anybody who has ever uh, bought a brand new computer program knows is it's messy and it's unpredictable and it actually turns the consumers, in this case uh, people with mental disorders, into um, basically guinea pigs, uh, which has a whole different resonance when it comes to uh, psychiatric, to mental illness uh, from what it has if it comes to a new app on your iPhone. Uh, so speaking of guinea pigs, one of, one of my favorite parts of this book is that you, along the way, take part in the clinical trials um, to, de to determine these uh, new criteria. Can you talk about what your experience was with your patients and going through uh, the APA guidelines of how to... Um... Yeah, so, so the, the, day, the APA conducted trials to, to sort of road test the DSM, and um, they did that by, among other things, contacting clinicians and asking them to take patients through a new procedure by which their symptoms would be assessed. And I uh, signed up to be one of those clinicians. And on the same day that they told me from the press office that they wouldn't talk to me anymore, the uh, people running the field trials told me I was accepted as a clinician <laughs> uh, to run. I, I may have something I can read about this. Okay, great. Uh, let, let me see. Uh, So uh, let, me, let me read you a little bit about what it's like to have a new... So the idea was I would run a new person, somebody I'd never met before, through these clinical trials. And what really struck me about it was the disconnect between this idea that if somebody was going to come into my office for whatever her... her it was a woman, her me mental problems were, her suffering was, and this computer test that I had to give her. Um, uh, I call her in the book Claudia 